One of the main risks of leaving my home country, Eritrea, is the danger. The danger of running out of food and water, getting lost in the wilderness, or being shot by your own army. Even if you manage to survive all of this and get to a neighboring country, you can still get snatched up and sold by other human beings. So if an Eritrean is willing to risk all of this to get out, you can imagine how horrific life must be within. I had to leave my home country in 2012, and just a few weeks later, I was dangling by my hands in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt. So how did I end up being a victim of human trafficking? To go back a little, since its independence in 1991, Eritrea has been plagued by the same ruthless dictator, Isaiah Saforki. His regime controls every single aspect of life in Eritrea. There is no constitution, there is no rule of law, no elected representation or legal opposition, and of course, no free press at all. The baseline is always, do as we say and want, or else. That or else part could mean indefinite imprisonment or immediate execution. I was born a refugee to parents who themselves were refugees in Sudan when they fled Eritrea during its war of independence. The only time in my life that I haven't been a refugee was when my parents decided to go back home to Eritrea when I was 11 years old. For a few years back then, I got to see Eritrea at its happiest. People seemed to be in a constant state of euphoria because we had finally gotten our independence after 30 long years of war for independence. People were debating government policies openly in the media. Independence Day celebrations seemed to go on for weeks. Even though I was young, I remember using my own pocket money to buy private newspapers just to read about heroic tales of, tales of freedom fighters. Basic human rights seemed to be a given at that time. But slowly, telltale signs of oppression started to pop up. Journalists and ministers from the same ruling po party were rounded up and made to disappear just for calling out for uh, democratic reforms. The only semi-explanation given by the government that they were traitors and that they were planning to sell out the country. No proof was given. Despite this, some people believe the government's narrative. But when the regime comes after you, you start to wake up. University students were hunted down like criminals and collectively punished for protesting an unfair government policy. Overnight, free press was gone. Our only university was shut down and replaced with government colleges that were basically military schools. And students that attend these colleges and basically every single adult in Eritrea are forced into lifelong military service. In name, they call it national service, but in reality, it's just modern-day slavery. Lifelong military conscription until your body simply stops functioning. And regardless of what you think about this or whatever opinion you have, you can never say it aloud, otherwise that or else threat of the regime comes to you. Even though I was assigned a military unit after college, I didn't go, because I did not want to be a slave to anyone. If this had been an actual national service where you're building your nation, that would be an honor. But this was simply enriching a few individuals in power. I did not want to spend my life in a colonel's farm or building yet again another villa for a general or laboring away in the gold mines. I refused to be part of this. Unfortunately for me, there exists a government surveillance system called GIFA in Eritrea. GIFA is when military personnel and government agents search through towns and cities to catch people like me who refused to join and some others who went missing from the so-called national service. Due to this, I had to hide with some friends, relatives in different areas most of the time. 
It was a constant state of fear for me. I had to look over my shoulders the entire time. There is almost no household in Eritrea that hasn't been affected by this fear. And the fear of what will happen to you potentially is even greater than the severity of your current situation, if you can imagine that. In 2012, I finally got the opportunity to escape this open-air prison. My group and I, we knew the risks. We knew that we can get kidnapped, but worst of all, we knew that we can get deported right back to Eritrea. After careful planning, it took us three days through the wild to reach the Shagrab refugee camp in Sudan. But this is where my experience as a victim of human trafficking began. I had the misfortune of being one of the first to be kidnapped by the Rashida tribe and transported to south of Egypt. We knew we were being sold to the Bedouins because we could see our captors fighting over us. To them, we were not even beings, rather we were just living cash. After taking us to the Sinai Peninsula, they demanded $3,500. After this ransom was paid, they sold us again to another Bedouin who in turn demanded $30,000. I knew this amount of money was difficult, if not outright impossible for my family. And I could already see some other victims who had been in this camp for almost a year trying to pay this ransom, who were so malnourished that they couldn't even stand on their own. They had to just crawl on the sand with their elbows. After seeing this, I just hoped to die quickly so that it would be over with. But my family worked out a miracle. They managed to gather all this money from relatives, friends, acquaintances, somehow, some of the story I still to this day, I don't know. They came up with the $30,000. It took them three months. In the meantime, we were being tortured nonstop. Beatings day in, day out. Your left leg would be chained to your right leg, and the, your right leg would be chained to the left leg of the next person. The escape was not an option. They would force you to call your family, and while you're talking to them, they would pour molten plastic on your body so that your screams would encourage your family to pay faster. They would dangle you from the ceiling this way, and the then the beatings would continue, and sometimes upside down, and again the beatings would continue. It's this technique that finally damaged both my hands. I could not feel them anymore. My hands looked like charcoal black, and the flesh was simply started to drip like molten plastic. I knew that my body was shutting down. After the ransom was paid, I was sent to another Badawi. Unlike the others before him, this guy was kind to us. He did not torture us. In fact, he helped us get safely to Israel, along with a, another group of Eritrean and Sudanese refugees. I spent the next three months in an Israeli hospital where I occasionally heard the word amputation because they almost didn't have any hope to save my hands. But after some experimental surgeries, they managed to patch up parts of my hands and managed to save my life. After being discharged from the hospital, I tried to, or to contact organizations for help, and I was also doing interviews to raise awareness about this human trafficking cycle that was happening still. Almost no one was talking about it then. For me, that was surreal. How could thousands die like this right next door and it not even be in a single minute of news time? To jump a little to the future, after long physiotherapy and integration in Germany, even though I'm a slower typist now, I got to continue my old job software development. So this is my story. But this is, it's also the story of countless other refugees, some with even more harrowing experiences than mine. There is a new wave of brutality in Eritrea. The cultural strength of our communities is being eroded to the point of being non-existent. The majority of people trying to leave Eritrea are children in their early teens because they don't even have a single reason to stay. Meanwhile, the dictatorial regime of Eritrea, the North Korea of Africa, is trying to warm its relations to the West by allowing Western corporations to work in Eritrean borders. But this does not mean that the regime has changed its ways. 
It only means that a poor soul like me, my brothers and sisters who are still living in Eritrea, will be forced into lifelong slavery wherever these corporations are active. So to any nation or corporations that already have a financial deal or, or even thinking about having a financial deal with this regime, don't. Stop supporting this regime by funding it. Because none of these funds will ever reach the, hand of, the hands of civilians at all. I had a very good income when I was in Eritrea, but no life during which to spend it. And I would rather be a homeless beggar in Germany, my current residence, than be a multimillionaire in Eritrea where my life is never my own. Whether I live or die, whether I'm free or prison is not dependent on my actions, but rather on a whim of some individuals. We do not have a money problem. Refugees have a safety, justice, and freedom-related issues. So I hope, nay, nay, I wish and pray that when countries try to implement policies that would make the lives of refugees, many of whom have been trafficked, harder than it already is, that you would shout out, not, no, not in my name. And perhaps to those countries that start to see this refugee issue as a burden, remember the story, is what I would say. Remember that Philmon and others like him did not choose to be refugees. Philmon's body was sold and trafficked and almost left for dead. Philmon and others like him were fleeing for their lives. And with a little integration effort, the so-called refugee problem could end up being a blessing in disguise to all hosting nations. Help us in tyranny in Eritrea so that we don't have to choose between dictatorship and human trafficking. Thank you.